Welcome to Free Christian Church of God's video outreach ministry, bringing the gospel message of Jesus Christ into your home each and every Sunday morning. If you would like more information about the video ministry or other ministries that we have to offer, stay tuned immediately following this program. And now, open your Bibles and follow along as we bring you today's message. Matthew chapter 5. Now, I want to hear from your heart. Lift your Bible near. Say it along with me. This is my Bible. It's God's infallible Word. I am who it says I am. I have what it says I have, and I can do what it says I can do. Today, I'll be taught the Word of God. I'm about to receive the incorruptible, indestructible, ever-living seed of the Word of God. My mind is alert, my heart is receptive, and I will never be the same in Jesus' name. Feeling better about you already. Matthew chapter 5, I want you to read closely here. Pay attention to this. It, now when he saw the crowds, talking about Jesus, he went up on a mountainside and he sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Father, we pray you for your anointing over your word, and God, I pray you'll open our eyes. That you'll open our eyes and our hearts today, God, that we'll see some things that maybe we, we've not been able to see before. God, there's so much bad information out there and so many, so many things being preached and taught in, the name, uh, uh, in your name and in the name of your word, God, that aren't, that aren't your word. And God, I pray that you'll open our eyes and our hearts today to what you, Jesus said, to what you said right here in the Sermon on the Mount. And God, that this truth might become a part of who we are and how we live, and God, a better understanding of what it's like to walk yeah, in, in the steps of Jesus. Father, anoint your word to accomplish your will. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. Sermon today. I don't know if they have that up there. Believe it or not, you're blessed. How many of you are blessed? How many of you are blessed? <laughs> All right, hold that thought. <laughs> I have in my office books that contain some of the greatest sermons ever preached, sermons by Wesley and Whitfield and Spurgeon. I, I really don't think that today's church would be tough enough to handle their preaching. I'm not so sure the church was, uh, was tough enough back then to handle their preaching. Charles Spurgeon preached in, in a church, and now people stayed and they listened to him, but they didn't like him because of the way he preached. And he was preaching in the church, but the pastor wasn't there, and when it came time to take up the offering to give to Spurgeon, there, somebody had hidden the offering plates. So Spurgeon took off his hat, and he passed it around. When it came back to him, there was nothing in it. Spurgeon bowed his head and he prayed, Dear God, I thank you that at least these tight wads gave me back my hat. <laughs> Christians, they are a little too thin-skinned to hear messages like, like these men preach. George Whitfield won over half a million souls to the Lord through his preaching. It was estimated that Whitfield preached on the subject, You Must Be Born Again, over 3,000 times. One of his critics asked him why, do he, why he preached so many times on exactly the same subject, to which he replied, Because, sir, you must be born again. Charles Spurgeon said, We need to have a church in which all the members do something in which all do all they can, in which all are always doing all they can, for this is what our Lord deserves to have from a living, loving people bought with his precious blood. If he has saved me, I will serve him forever and ever, and whatever lies in my power to do for his glory, that shall be my delight to do, and to do it at once. Spurgeon was also very committed when it came to preaching. He said, the motto of all true servants of God must be, we preach Christ and him crucified. A sermon without Christ in it is like a loaf of bread without any flour in it. No Christ in your sermon, sir, then go home and never preach again until you have something worth preaching. 
I don't think that anybody ever left these preachers' sermons saying, I wonder what he meant. <laughs> there have been many great preachers over the centuries, but the greatest preacher that ever lived was Jesus. No man's preaching compares to his, not Spurgeon, not Whitfield, not even Billy Graham or one of the famous preachers of our day, because when Jesus spoke, every word that he spoke was the word of God. As a minister of the gospel, I can quote the Bible and I can reference the Bible and expound on the Bible, but at my very best, I cannot write the Bible. Jesus was God in the flesh, and every word that he spoke was the word of God. He was the greatest preacher to ever live, and that's why we need to give utmost attention to his message. We can't afford to doze off. We can't afford to skip through it or gloss over it. We can't afford to reinterpret it or to cast it aside, but every word, every inflection, every comma, and every period must be treated with the respect that is due our holy God because every word that Jesus spoke was the word of God. We've drifted from our reverence for God's word. We, we don't look at the Bible with the same awe and respect that those who came before us did. We don't treat the Bible as though it were a holy book. For many, the Bible has become a book of sayings. It's become an instruction manual or ancient literature. But the Gospel of John tells us that in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Do you understand what John was saying? John was telling us that this, this, this book that you are holding in your hands today, is as sacred and as divine as God himself. Because it is the word of the living God. It's God himself on the printed page, and in it God is speaking to you and me, imparting to us divine wisdom, and telling us things that we must know. The longest and most complete sermon of Jesus that we have found is in Matthew chapter 5 through 7. The Sermon on the Mount is the longest continuous piece of teaching from Jesus in the New Testament and it's been one of the most widely quoted elements of the gospel. Chapter 5 of Matthew has been quoted by the church fathers far more than any other passage in the entire Bible, and chapters 5 through 7 more than any other three successive chapters. Augustine said uh, that Jesus' Sermon on the Mount was a perfect standard of the Christian life. It's a perfect standard for the Christian life because it contains the central tenets of Christian discipleship. If you want to know what a real Christian is, right here is God's description. Jesus covered it all in one great sermon. Everything that we need to know about being a Christian and living a godly life is in this message. If you want Christianity in a nutshell, this is it. If you can get this, then you're going to get everything else. Each Sunday when I preach... I asked the Lord, what do you want your people to walk out of here with today? Lord, what is the one thing that you want these free Christian people to get? And sometimes the Holy Spirit will say, I want them to get this. And sometimes God will give me a subject that could be offensive or clearly controversial. And I'll say, Lord, are you sure? Are you sure? Could it be something else? Maybe another subject. Could you give me, like, maybe a multiple choice? Lord, you know some of our good people are going to get angry at me if I preach about that. Some people's going to be offended. Some people won't understand. And some just won't like it. But if you have ever been here on Sunday morning, you know who wins that discussion. Because when it comes right down to it, I'd rather offend you than offend God. Charles Spurgeon said, a good sermon does a man most good when it makes him most angry. Mm. Those people who walk down the aisles and say, I will never hear that man again, very often have an arrow rankling in their breast. There's a focal point to every sermon and a foundation of truth that the message is built upon. Quite often that focal point is offensive. Hebrews 4.12 says the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of the soul and spirit, of the joints and the marrow, and it is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. When you hear the word of God, it will pierce you. It will cut through your defenses and enter deep within your soul. And when it pierces you, it will either do surgery or it will do damage. If you surrender to the Word of God, it will fix you. But if you try to get away, if you try to escape, it will take you apart. 
The Word of God will cut you through and enter into the very depths of your being, and it will touch parts of you that you have kept guarded. That's why some of you are uncomfortable with church. That's why you have trouble sitting through a sermon. That's why some of you can only come every now and then. You have to go home and and, and let your wounds heal before you dare come back again. But instead of fighting him off, allow the Word of God to finish God's work in you. The last verse of Matthew 5 is considered to be the focal point that summarizes Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And it's this. He says, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Is that hard for you to understand? Is that hard for anybody? To, is that over anybody's head? Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Jesus is ever advising his would-be disciples to pursue the path of perfection and holiness and to seek first and foremost the kingdom of God. Church, where did that go? Where did that go? When did we stop our pursuit of holiness? When did it become okay to claim Christianity but still look and act like the world around us? When did it become passing to be imperfect and harbor sin in our life? You live like you want, you do what you want, and you don't do what you don't want to do, but I want to ask you, is that going to make you more confident when you stand before God in judgment? Pursue perfection. Seek God's kingdom. Jesus sets the bar bar high for all believers. The goal that he sets for all of us is perfection. Leviticus uh, 20.26 says, You are to be holy because I, the Lord, am holy, and I set you apart from the nations to be my own. 1 Peter 1.16 reaffirms, For it is written, Be holy because I am holy. As a child of God, our standard for living isn't the status quo. It's not to be politically correct or to be socially acceptable. It's not just to be moral or ethical or better than most and as good as the rest. But the goal for every believer is godly perfection. Our holy God is to be our measuring stick and our standard, and we are to compare all things in our life to him. But we don't do that, do we? Typically, we'll choose the worst scoundrel in the church. We'll find the biggest hypocrite, and we'll compare ourselves to him. Well, I'm better than Howard, the hypocrite. I work harder in the church than Lazy Linda. I give more than tightwad Tom. And I'm more spiritual than society, Sally. But how do we measure up to the perfection of God himself? Perfection to us seems to be an impossible and unattainable goal. We've told ourselves that since we're nothing more than cursed flesh and we're prone to failure, and since uh, it's so difficult to live for God in this day and age, since the times have changed and since the Bible was written, we're convinced that we have a legitimate excuse to be imperfect. But Jesus still sets a standard high. Not just to remind us that we can never reach it as we are, under our own strength and under our own power, but also to point out to us that we can attain it through him. Christian, listen to me. There is a level that you have not reached because you haven't permitted God to help you get there. You have joined groups and you've read books and you tried disciplining yourself, but you still fail and fall short because you are yet to understand that you can't do this by yourself. The Sermon on the Mount describes what our life as a Christian should be like in faith, in our thoughts, in our words, and in our actions. Jesus said six times in chapter 5, You have heard it said, but I tell you. But I tell you. We need to stop listening to the talk. We need to stop listening to opinions. We need to stop listening to the gossip and the advice and get back into the word of the living God. I don't care what so-and-so says. What does God say? I don't care what so-and-so thinks. What does God say? I don't care what everybody else is doing and says is acceptable. What does God say? Jesus said, you've heard it said, but I tell you. Jesus was contrasting popular opinion and tradition with what God really demands of his servants. And he called his people out of the legal system which the Pharisees had put on them, and he called them into new life. Many people approach Christianity in God like the Pharisees did. They see Christianity as a system of religious practices. They see it as attending church and owning a Bible and saying an occasional prayer and maybe doing a few good deeds, any of all of which can become laborious at times. That's why you get tired and they get lazy. That's why they start skipping church and neglect to read their Bible. That's why they don't tithe to God's church and why they don't show up when the work needs to be done. It's the reason that people eventually backslide and leave the church, and it's the very reason why we need to wake up call of preaching. 
We need the wake-up call of preaching to shake us out of our sleep and wake us up and remind us that true faith in God is a way of life. 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 52 weeks out of the year. The message of his sermon is timeless. It's ageless because men and women are fundamentally the same. We all have the same temptations, and we all have the same weaknesses, and often we fall into the same traps as those who lived 2,000 years before us. The focal point of his message is godly perfection. Jesus said, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. He set the bar high for us so that we can't reach it on our own, therefore forcing us to be dependent on him to achieve his ultimate will in our life. So many people today are trying to be all they can be, but they still don't amount to much. (laughs) You know them? But with the power of God, Jesus says all things are possible. So many people today discard Jesus' words, and they create their own religion. I'm going to be teaching a little bit of this on Sunday nights when we do our Sunday night services because we we have packaged Christianity until it's become a happy meal. And what I want to do is get back into the truth of what the Bible teaches. But so many people take Jesus' words and they, they throw them out and they create their own religion. They set their own goals. They set goals that they're certain to attain, goals that they can't miss, and ultimately goals that only apply to their fleshly desires. But God's goal for us is heavenly. It's so far above us and so far beyond us that we will be frustrated if we ever try to reach that goal on our own. You might be giving your best effort right now, you might, but you just can't seem to get there. You're, you're doing everything that you know how to do, but you just can't reach it. You don't understand because you've given 100%, but it doesn't seem to be enough, and you're frustrated. No one has the wherewithal to be a Christian on their own. None of us are strong enough or intelligent enough or even spiritual enough. But we all need divine help. We need spirit, supernatural help. We need God's help to become all that we can be perfect and holy, just as our Creator is perfect and holy, and He demands for us to be. Now, God set our, 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 the standard as perfection. He set our sights on perfection. And yet, the very first topic that Jesus tackles, the first thing that He preaches about in His Sermon on the Mount is blessing. This is a good topic. This is a people pleaser, because everybody wants to be blessed. I want to be blessed, don't you? Bless me, Lord Jesus. <laughs> Well, hold that thought, because you might change your mind before I'm finished. The goal of being blessed has become a multi-million dollar industry in the church. There are books and CDs and seminars on how to be blessed. Now, we're true Americans, and we want what we want when we want it, but in our selfishness and in our self-centeredness, we have confused the avenues that God has provided to us to take us to where we can receive those blessings. We hear about blessings, but a lot of us don't seem to have any. We see some people with great wealth and good health, and everything is going their way, but not us. Not us. So we're convinced that either we're not blessed, or worse yet, we might be cursed. We're dealing with sickness and death. We're dealing with financial struggles. We're dealing with persecution. We're dealing with conflict. We're dealing with grief. And we're convinced that God must not love us or that he doesn't care about us when nothing can be further from the truth. We are confused because we have been misled and misinformed when it comes to God's blessing. Pay attention here. When we think of blessings, we think about things. We think of houses and cars. We think, when we think about blessings, we think about money and all of the wonderful stuff that money can buy. We think about health or our lack of problems. When we think of blessings, we think about our beautiful children or our good-looking wife or a hunk of a husband. But the truth is, those things are not what God considers to be blessings. Church, pay attention. We pray to God, and we ask God to bless us, but in return, God allows grief and heartache and suffering and persecution to enter our lives. So we begin to think that God must not love us, that he really didn't hear our prayer. Maybe he just enjoys watching us suffer, and we miss the point entirely. We want easy roads. We want to take the path of least resistance. We don't want to travel through the valley. We don't want to encounter opposition. We don't want to face adversity. We just want an easy road. And there are many teachers and preachers out there who will tell us what we want to hear, and they will give us directions on how to get to those easy roads. We want to hear that God only gives his children good things. But our idea of good things and God's idea of good things are two different things. We want to hear that we can get what we want instead of getting 
what we need. When I was a little boy, my grandparents had a candy dish. They had a candy dish, but in Grandma's candy dish were green jellies, Pepto-Bismol mints, and whorehound. Who knows what I'm talking about? <laughs> Grandma would say to me, do you want a piece of candy? And I said, sure, Grandma, what kid doesn't want candy? And then I would get a piece of whorehound. Some of you, you guys, you have no idea. I'll get you some. I put it in my mouth and go, oh, Grandma. She'll say, it's whorehound. Do you like it? No, Grandma, nobody does. <laughs> well, I wanted to do better than my grandparents, so Lisa and I have a pantry at home with a whole lot of bad stuff in it. I have a drawer in my office, and in that drawer is a bag of gummies, a bag of little licorice bites, and a bag of something else. I'm not sure what else in there. All of my grandchildren and a whole lot of your kids now know where that is. I go in my office, there's a half dozen kids from junior church behind my desk. I wanted to do better than my grandparents. That kind of thing is very attractive to children, and we grandparents know that. We know that, that's why we have it. But we also understand that we have to limit what they get. We know that our grandkids cannot survive on sugar. We know that a lot of sugar isn't good for them. Sugar isn't what they need. But if they're going to grow and be healthy and develop into a mature human being who still has teeth when they reach adulthood, then first and foremost, we need to give them what's good for them. We don't always want what's good for us. We don't always want what God in his divine providence provides for us. We, we don't want the meat and the potatoes, and we certainly don't want the Brussels sprouts, but sometimes we just want sugar. But our Heavenly Father, who knows best, knows that sugar isn't always the best. God knows that the easy roads aren't always the best roads, and sometimes the easy roads aren't even the right roads. God has numbered our steps, and he has choreographed our course. He might not always lead us in the direction that we want to go, but God knows what direction is best and which road will lead us to him. We all want to be blessed, and Jesus teaches us the nine attitudes that will bring that, us into that blessing. These attitudes are be attitudes, explain to us that if we want a happy and fulfilled life, we are to live differently than the rest of this world. The word blessed means happy, happy. We all want to be happy, don't we? Jesus is telling us that when these attributes become a part of who we are, God is pleased with us, and we are blessed. We are happy. Now, most of us pursue trivial things. As I said before, we want money, we seek after position, and we strive for power. We, we want health, and we want our uh, friends, and we want acknowledgement. We pursue things. But Jesus is plainly telling us that if we want happiness, that it will never come from the trivial positions and possessions of this world, but true happiness will only be found in our heart when our attitudes are right with God. We get this one all wrong. And we've gotten it wrong for a long time, and I really don't understand why. It's right here in front of us in plain, bold, red letters. Jesus said, blessed are. If you want to know who is blessed, these are the people who God says are blessed. It's not what you've been hearing. There are a bunch of Willy Wonka preachers out there who are passing out candy and telling it's, it, you it's God's way of blessing you, but I want you to know, church, they are lying to you. The blessing of God isn't what Joel Osteen says it is. It's not what Creflo Dollar says it is. It's not what Kenneth Copeland says it is. It's not what Mike Murdoch says it is. It's not what Joseph Prince says it is. But the blessing of God is what Jesus says it is. I debated on whether or not tell you that, but I'll tell you, church, we're in a day and age where you better know the truth. And you better know who's lying to you. You better know what it takes to live for God, and you better know who is telling you the wrong direction. You'd think that if Jesus wanted his followers to be spirit people instead of flesh people, he would have began his message with another subject. Maybe self-denial or stewardships or something like that. Yet Jesus begins his message speaking about blessings. But the way Jesus explains the subject of happiness and blessing is a far cry from what we think when we think about the things, those things today. We think of blessings as things. 
things that will ultimately make us happy. When we think of blessings, we think of houses and cars and money. We think of health and a problem-free life. When we think of blessings, we think of a happy marriage and happy children and a happy home. Don't get me wrong. If you have those things, you need to drop to your knees and thank God. You know that you don't deserve them, and you didn't earn them, and if you have them, you need to thank God every moment of every day. But what you need to understand is that the people who have such things aren't necessarily blessed. Sometimes we're envious of other people whose lives seem to be going better than ours. Has that ever happened to you? <laughs> you're struggling along, and you're eking away through life, and then you run into someone who has it made in the shade. And they start telling you about it. And, and, and you want to, in a very kind, Christ-like sort of way, punch them right in the nose. I spoke to a man a few years ago who had, got, had, had a very good paying job. But with that job, he had to travel a lot. He told me that he had been offered another job that would pay him $11,000 more per year and wouldn't force him to travel around the world. I don't know why he was telling me this. <laughs> It sounded really good. But a couple of weeks later, he called me again. He said, you know, there's been a good turn of events. I didn't think the last turn was too bad. He said, I went to my boss, and I told him what was going on. And I gave him my two weeks' notice, but he didn't want me to leave, so he made a counteroffer to me for more money than the 11000 And he told me that we, he would work with me on my personal schedule. What do you think of that? Two raises, and I didn't even have to change jobs. I told him, I think I'll go to the elders Wednesday night and give him my two weeks' notice. <laughs> we sometimes are envious of other people whose life seems to be going better than ours. It appears that God is blessing them a whole lot more than he is blessing us. They have more things, and they have better things than we do, and on top of it all, all of their neat stuff, they don't have any problems. Along with that, we are frustrated because we know that we're a better Christian than they are. Well, who's identifying with this? We're in church, we pray, we tithe, we don't go out sinning on the weekend, but we go and we work at the church on one of those big projects that our crazy pastors come up with. Some of the people who claim Christianity but don't live in holiness seem to be more blessed than we are. Somebody say amen. That's why I think that Jesus spells it out so plainly. plainly. He says, blessed are. If you want to know who's blessed, I'll tell you who's blessed. Jesus is pointing out to us that we might have this blessing thing all wrong. It's possible that we are confused. Jesus said, blessed are, and then he tells us who is blessed. But as intriguing as his list is, I think that it is equally intriguing as to who is not on his list. Pay attention here. Jesus doesn't say, blessed are the rich. I don't read that anywhere, do you? He doesn't say, blessed are the healthy. Not in here. He doesn't say, blessed are the people who have no problems. Doesn't seem to matter if you have the King James Version, the New American Standard, or the NIV. He doesn't say, blessed are those who are popular. He doesn't say, blessed are those who never have to deal with conflict. He doesn't say, blessed are those who never have to deal with sickness or deal with the death of a loved one. He doesn't even say, blessed are the prosperous or that the prosperous are blessed. If Jesus is talking about blessings, then why doesn't he mention the people that we have come to believe are blessed? He begins his sermon by building a case for those whom God says are doing Christianity right. He puts together a picture of someone who's blessed. The Beatitudes are a composite of the faithful in whom God is well pleased. But what is so fascinating is that if you take the time to put together all of these pieces, you will ultimately see the very image of Jesus Christ himself. Jesus was all of these things. And in turn, we are to become all of these things if we're truly going to be blessed by God. Who still wants to be blessed? <laughs> Be careful, you might put your hand in the air because you want to look spiritual to the person sitting next to you, but God might be writing your name down. <laughs> oh, John wants to be blessed. Judy wants to be blessed. Be careful. If you ask God to bless you, he just might do it. What Jesus tells us doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense to us because our minds have been so infected by our trivial world and we are so misled by bad preaching and we're so much more flesh-driven than we are spirit-driven that we're unable to see or understand heavenly truths. Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit. To be poor in spirit is to realize that nothing we have is worth more than the kingdom of God. 
Earthly possessions are of no value. Money isn't important. Prosperity isn't important. Social position isn't important. Jesus said those who are blessed are those who are willing to part with anything that they have if it hinders them from receiving God's kingdom. That doesn't sound like what we're hearing on TV. We must be humble in our spirits. If you put the word humble in place of the word poor, you'll understand what Jesus was saying. When we come to God, we have to realize our own sin and our own spiritual emptiness and poverty, and we must not be self-satisfied or proud in our hearts, thinking that we are so self-sufficient that we really don't need God. The Bible says in James 4, 6, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Pride can come in all kinds of forms, but the worst kind of pride is spiritual pride. Often the richer we are in possessions, the poorer we are in our hearts. So you have nothing today but Jesus, believe it or not, you're blessed. <coughs> Jesus said, blessed are those who mourn. God can't bless you in mourning until you go through something to mourn about. The valley that you are walking through, the trial that you are facing, the things that have happened to you that has broken you down and brought tears to your eyes and anguish to your soul is the very thing that God is going to use to bless you. He can't bless you until you go through it. He can't bless you until you endure it. You might be asking God, God, why me? But God knows you. He understands you because God has made you. God has seen something in you that he hasn't seen in other people. When he made you, he created something in you that is strong and enduring, that's able to take you through an experience that would devastate anyone else. You've been chosen because of what God created in you. You've dealt with tragedy. You've dealt with illness. You've walked through the valley of the shadow of death. The path of your life has taken you through some very dark places, but God knows you. He's never lost track of you, and even though your path has been somewhere that you didn't want to go, your Heavenly Father, who loves you more than anyone could ever love you and has a better plan for your life than anyone could ever imagine, has charted your path through those things. If you're walking such a path, embrace where you are. Because as bad as it might be, God has brought you here. And you'll get through it because, believe it or not, you're blessed. Who needs to hear this? Who needs to hear this? Blessed are the meek. Meekness is the receiving of injuries with the belief that God will vindicate you. Most of us prefer to provide our own defense. We are all conceal and carry people. <laughs> we might not own a gun, but we do have a weapon. It might be our memory that never forgets with somebody it has done. Might be our wit. It might be our sharp tongue that can take the feet out from under anybody. But we all have a weapon. And we feel, when we feel threatened and when we feel that we're under attack, we draw. Meekness comes from a heart that's too great to be moved by little insults. It's the Christian who knows that God doesn't need their help to stop their enemies, but he alone is the equalizer who will step in and set the record straight and vindicate those who faithfully serve him. Romans chapter 12, verse 19 to 21 says, Do not take revenge. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. All too often, we don't allow room for God to do anything. We already have our battle plan. We already have our plan of attack, and we have loaded our weapons, and we're waiting for our moment. But Christian, when you do that, you are sinning in the face of God. Do not take revenge, dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge, and I will repay, says the Lord. If you want to do something, he says, on the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not overcome, be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Oh, that's how we live, isn't it? For those of you who have been attacked or who are now being attacked, let God fight your battle. Lay down your weapons. Sit back and watch God defend you. Because believe it or not, you're blessed. You're blessed. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. No being is indestructible or unfailing except God. As the body depends upon nourishment, health, and strength upon this earth, so does our soul depend on heaven. Heavenly things can't support the body. They're not suited to its nature. But earthly things cannot support the soul for the same reason. You're a child of God, and you have this hunger and thirst in you for heavenly things. 
What you used to do doesn't do it for you anymore. You feed on Sunday, and then you feed on Wednesday, but it never seems to be enough. You know, somebody say, oh, if I could just be at the church seven days a week, we would get tired of you. <laughs> you still want more. You just wish that you could stay at the church all of the time and pig out, but you can't do that. Throughout the, so throughout the course of the week, you grow hungry. Every week you go back into the world and you're tempted to fill your soul with things that are not of God. And sometimes you get weak and you give in. Sometimes you fall to temptation and you get sick on the inside because you know that's not who you are anymore. If there's a longing in your heart today for the righteousness of God, that means that God is getting ready to bless you. Don't waste your time and your resources on things that will never satisfy the hunger that's in your soul. And if you're still hungry and if you're still thirsty for more of God, just sit down at his table and he'll fill you because, believe it or not, you're blessed. Blessed are the merciful. Have you ever looked at a need and you were so moved by that need that you felt a pain in your heart? That's what Jesus is talking about here. He's talking about those who have a merciful heart that moves them to action to relieve the pain of others. Now, I'm not talking about going to the pastor or going to the missions board because you've seen a need. Say, hey, there's a need out there. You need to take care of it. But I'm talking about seeing a need and taking care of that need yourself. Have you ever stopped to consider why other people haven't noticed the need? Have you ever considered why God has shown that need to you? God has shown that need to you because he has equipped you to meet that need. It isn't someone else's job or someone else's responsibility. Those who see a need and are moved by that need and then take action to meet that need are blessed. They're blessed because in turn they will receive from God the same kind of mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Jesus is speaking about those who are pursuing the holiness that he has already demanded. They've forsaken their past sins and their past way of life, and they're striving to walk in holiness every day and in every way. They don't perceive God as other people do, they're, but there is an intimacy, and there's become an understanding of God that has evaded other believers. They make no excuses. They have no secret closet or hidden sin, but they've allowed the Holy Spirit to enter into the most remote corners of their life and to shine light where there used to be darkness. And because of that, they are able to see God in a way that others who are not as serious, who are not as committed, not as dedicated, can see. The pure in heart who behold God as the righteous judge, and not just as a friend or as their heavenly butler, are going to be given a blessing of one day seeing him face to face. They will see God in all of his power and all of his glory. They will be given the special honor of coming into his presence to look upon the face of the King of kings because they are blessed. Blessed are the peacemakers. To be a peacemaker, you have to be in the midst of conflict. You can't be a peacemaker until you're thrust into the middle of a war. You can't be a peacemaker until you're on the front line, dodging bullets and taking cover from the attacks of the enemy. You can't be a peacemaker until you lay down your weapons and stand on the bridge between those who are at war. I don't know about you, but I am tired of protests. I am tired of protest. I am tired of complaining. I want somebody who has a solution. In the day, this day of violence and protest, we all need someone to bridge the gap, to become the voice of reason between those who do not or cannot communicate. We don't need more fuel on the fire. We don't need awareness, and we don't need more opinions or more advice, but we need a peacemaker who will settle the feud. That's what Jesus did. On Calvary's cross, Jesus bridged the gap between God and man, and he gave his life to end the war. For those who willingly volunteer to step into the battle and try to bring peace, who will take the hits and who will absorb the wounds, God will call them his sons and daughters because they bear in themselves the attributes of their creator. And God says they're blessed. Lastly, Jesus said, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. I'm not very happy when people are lying about me and making up stories about me and trying to hinder the good that I'm trying to do. But God says, I'm blessed. I'm blessed. There's some days that I'd rather not like to be not quite so blessed. The Jews have a saying, 
and I'll try to say this right. Ahal at al al at. Be thou cursed, but do not curse. The accent is upon that it is better to be the one of them that are cursed than to be of them that do the cursing. Because in the end, the causeless curse will return to the one that did the cursing. Going right back to what God said, I will take revenge. You might be taking a beating right now. You're trying to live for Jesus, and it has people talking. But a lot of what they're saying about you isn't the truth. You're being lied about and you're being made fun of and it's making it more difficult for you to serve the Lord. But Jesus is trying to encourage you. God knows how all of this is going to end. He knows who will win and he knows that he who celebrates last will celebrate best. So keep on keeping on. Stand strong and courageous because believe it or not, God says you're blessed. So do you still want to be blessed? (laughs) Maybe God has been trying to bless you but you've been missing the point. You've asked God to deliver you from your trial or to stop something that's happening in your life or you've been trying on your own to fix your troubles when all along God has just been trying to bless you. Whatever you might be facing, understand that the blessing of God is upon you. Then embrace what's going on, you're going through. Praise God in your trials. Honor Him when the going gets tough. Stand up and be active in God's kingdom. Work because the night is coming. Rescue the perishing and care for the dying. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. God knows when it's all going to end, and when it does, you need to make certain that you can kneel humbly and proudly in the presence of the King of Kings, knowing that you have been all that you could be, and you've done all that you could do for God and for His kingdom. You want to be like Jesus, but to be like Him, you have to be willing to face the same things that Jesus faced. He was rejected by those He came to save. They opposed his ministry and they tried to stop him. He was lied about and falsely accused and ultimately sentenced to death simply because he was holy. In Philippians 3, verse 10, the Apostle Paul said, I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participate in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I've already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Believe it or not, you're blessed. I wrote a book a few years ago. Copies of it are in the cafe room there. And I wrote it to good people who are going through bad things. Everything we hear today is about if you do it right and you have the faith, then everything you do is going to turn out great. It's going to be, you're going to be prosperous. You're going to have money. You're going to have health. You're going to have all this. You're not going to have any problems. But over the years of ministry, I've watched real people that I knew were real Christians, real, dedicated, committed saints of God who were going through trials that seemed very, very unfair and very, very unnecessary. And... I thought somebody needs to encourage these people. I want you to know if that's you. You're giving it your best. You're living for God with everything that you have. But since you become a Christian, life has become more miserable than it's ever been before. Believe it or not, you're blessed. And because you are blessed, God is happy. And because God is happy, you will be happy. You will be happy. Father, I thank you that sometimes your word speaks differently than all of the voices that we hear. The voices that ought to make sense that don't make sense. The things that ought to add up but don't add up. God, I am grateful that we want, when we want to know what the real truth is, that we can go to your word and we can hear it. Father, I pray today for those who maybe thought they were cursed. Life has been tough. They've gone through some horrible experiences. and Sometimes they feel like they're just out in left field and you're nowhere near. 
God, I pray that through Jesus' words today, they'll begin to understand that you're right there with them, and they are blessed. Father, encourage those who are discouraged. Lift up those who can't stand on their own. And God, might they, God, might they feel your pleasure. Father, anoint this time and do your work. In Jesus' name. Thank you for watching today's message from Free Christian Church of God in Continental Ohio. To find out more information about Free Christian Church of God, or to receive a copy of Rev. James Fry's weekly television program, Your Life, call the church office at area code 419-596-3103, or visit our website at freecog.org and download your copy today.